Okay, so hello and welcome to another episode of Determination, Deliberation, and Dragons. I am Peter, and we have Izzy as always. Hello. And we have, yet again, our wonderful guest, Julie. Hi, Julie. Hello. It's good to see you guys. Figuratively speaking. So. Figuratively speaking, yes. It is good I to mean, hear. We're literally seeing well, each no, other. I mean, well, our guys viewer- in the listeners. Oh, never mind. Sorry. Oh, I was saying it's good to see you guys to you two, whom I can see on the video call. But I will also say it is good to be heard by you listeners. I thought today, now that we finished talking about the Pana and Wave Skimmer cycle or whatever we're calling it, I forgot the word. It's been a while since we've recorded. It would be fun to talk about the story as a whole. So not just like each specific chapter, but just how they all kind of work together or don't work together. We'll see. And to do that, we invited Julie, who also read the story. So we'll, or at least I as the author, will get to see how the story was, you know, received from two like really wonderful readers. And we'll, I'll get to hear some criticisms and praises and whatever else they they want to throw my way and yeah that's about it and I also wanted to just kind of briefly talk about the way that workshops work in creative writing classes so at Vassar we would give like the rest of the class our story everyone would read it and then they would go around the room and each person would say you know, something that they thought worked really well and something that they thought could be improved upon. And the goal was to kind of really get an understanding of how the story was received, what impression it made, what people were thinking. And it was less of a space for the author to talk. Because in a lot of ways, the author's perspective, like what they intended, doesn't necessarily matter if their work was interpreted a certain way um at least that's you know that's one perspective that people in the english world can have and that's one that i have but for this workshop julian izzy will talk and they'll do some criticisms some praises and i will because we only have a workshop group of three people like i will jump into but with that being said i'm gonna open it up who wants to go first? Oh, I can Izzy? go. I have okay. talked plenty of times about the Pana cycle. I believe that's what we were calling it. I think so. I think that's the name you gave it. Yeah. So Izzy, one, I guess like one thing that you think worked well and one thing that you think could be improved upon. Mm-hmm. I'd say one thing that I really enjoyed is, It might be a bit strong to say magic system, but the magical item that is in the book, the magical stone, um, it's really intriguing and leaves me with a lot of questions, but it is one of the most engaging parts of the story for me, just reading on to find out what is the stone going to do next? Nobody knows how it works, so it could do kind of anything. And then you find out more as the story goes on and you're still left with a lot of questions, or I was left with a lot of questions because nothing is ever fully explained, but not in a way that feels unsatisfying, in a way that still really, you know, if there was ever a Pana Cycle 2, I would be very interested to see what happens to that rock, my favorite character. (laughs) But I think it's, um, sometimes can be a little heavy-handed to use a magic item and be like, magic sword, Excalibur, go! And then there's no really any mystery to it. It's just, you know, straightforward and it's a tool. But there, Rock is more, not fully a character, of course, but it's more of a um, thematic tool as well as um, literal tool. It carries a lot more weight. Those rocks are heavy, yes. I mean, I'm kind of thinking of it in the terms of Lord of the Rings with the ri- giant ring, not the giant ring, but the, the ring of power and how its powers are never fully explained, but it, that also gives it the ability to carry a lot more symbolic meaning as well. 
That's a good comparison. Oh, and um, I suppose the thing that could be, um, you know, workshopped a little more. I mean, your story is just growing as we as it goes, and there's so many things that came out of nowhere that ended up being really cool. But I think one thing I would say is sometimes the dialogue could be smoothened a little bit in that some characters have really clear voices and I understand, you know, I have a feel for who this character is just by the way they talk. Uh, for instance, MC, I know I have an idea very clear in my head of who she is. Other characters, um, they don't read as smoothly in their dialogue, but I think that's just something that comes with practice and, you know, trying out different speaker to speaky or combinations. Sometimes different characters interact better or sometimes they don't want to talk to each other. Yeah, that's really fair. Thank you for your praise and criticisms. I will definitely we'll talk more about that for sure. <laughs> Julie, do you want to go? <laughs> you ready? Yep, I'm ready. I have all my little notes written <laughs> out in front of me, so I'm raring to go. For me, there were a lot of moments that I enjoyed um, while I was reading this story. I think one of the moments that surprised me the most in a really great way was the vision that happens when they're on the lake. Um, just the initial setting of how the vision falls is very mysterious. People are falling asleep and I as the reader couldn't tell whether that was a good thing or a bad thing or a neutral thing. And it kept me in suspense in a good way. I was curious what was going to happen to these people who are stranded on this gigantic lake. And then when Pana's vision started, again, I really enjoyed it because it really worked as a vision for me. The way it was narrated what was both smooth and that I could follow what was going along, but also haphazard enough that it did feel like a vision or like a stream of conscience where things just flick in and out and you don't really know what the context is the whole time, but you have enough information that you can kind of get a sense of what's going on. I also really loved that vision because it sets a lot of background for the world that you're developing, Peter, um, in, in terms of the introduction of Helen. Who is this Helen? She's about as mysterious as the rock that Izzy was talking about. We don't know her full powers. And I'm really excited to see her story start to unfold, hopefully in future cycles of Pana and Wave Skimmer. Yeah, so I really liked the vision. I thought that was well done. And that was a good mixture of mystery and suspense, but it also, by the end of it, most of the characters were okay. And I went, oh, phew, thank goodness. Um, the, the Something that I liked but didn't like and wanted to see done better were the characters, which I think Izzy kind of touched on. Uh, your characters, like when you introduce them, they have great intros. When we first meet Kai, she talks about her father. And we're like, okay, we can connect with Kai trying to catch Pana in order to avenge her father's death. Um, in terms of like, she is very compelling uh, as a very awkward and yet very kind-hearted individual. Uh, Bob is incredibly friendly and, and Tally for, I, I just, I imagine her as a badass, like a woman who can do anything. Um, so when you introduced these characters, I was really engaged and wanted to learn more about them. And I think something that I noticed as I was reading along is that they don't really develop. We, we meet these engaging personalities and they kind of stay at, at that level. Uh, and I'd like to know more. Right, what are their backstories? What are their hopes and fears? Are there moments where they as characters struggle and fail? Are there moments when they have great successes? I, I just would really like to see that more fleshed out. Uh, already, Pana and Wave Skimmer, I, they are very well fleshed out, and I would love to see that uh, done for some of the reoccurring minor characters. 
I'd especially like to see that for Vare because once again, really interesting character. I have no idea what her relationship is with Hana. Like she seems like she's a friend and then an enemy and she's evil, but then she's helping people during this gigantic water storm. And then she's trying to kill people and release, you know, dragons with diseases that will, you know, sicken the whole world. That sounds like a bad idea. And I, I never really understood why Vare was doing what she did, um, both in the village and after the village. And I, I definitely think that I and other readers, readers would benefit knowing more about where Vare is coming from. Uh, that was a lot of talking, but yeah, I have a lot to a lot to say about your story, which is a good thing. You have many provoking things. Yeah, no, thank you. I I love your comments. I think the visions chapter, like I I wrote it and I was like super happy with it. Like there are really rare moments where I write something and I'm like, oh my word, that was amazing. And visions, I wrote it, I was like, this is great. Um, that that almost never happens. <laughs> and I think your your comments about the characters is, is very very fair, and it's interesting that you know this is a a common criticism with like you and Izzy and I think just speaks to the need for me to work on that and this is something like when we do workshops like you know we were always encouraged like if someone already said something like feel free to say it again um, and the more people who say it like you probably really need to work on that so yeah no I really appreciate your comments I think just to like stay on the topic of like characters so, I mean, Izzy, your comments are more about the dialogue, and Julie, you are more talking about, like, the actual characterization of them, like, who these people are. Are there, as you were reading, like, were there things that you were expecting, or were there there things that, when you finished, you were like, oh, I really wish that, like, I saw more of that? Hmm. I think for me in terms of what I would like to see more of from the characters. I would like more things that make me care about them. For And this, I guess, goes back to what I was commenting about earlier. Once we're introduced to characters like Like and Bob and, and Tally, they, they kind of stay there in the background and help, which is good. That's what minor characters are supposed to do. They, they are they are minor for a reason. Um, the main major characters should shine through, and Pana certainly shines through. But for some reason, as the story progressed, I I found myself struggling. I wasn't struggling to stay engaged with the characters actually, but it there there weren't a lot of moments where the minor characters were sh were allowed to to shine. For example, in Harry Potter and the Deadly Hallows, we. Like, Wormtail is a very interesting character. Uh, very devoted to the Dark Lord. He has that sketchy metal hand. And there's that scene in the Malfoy Manor where he, like, starts strangling Harry. And Harry tells him to stop. And Wormtail does stop. And then the hand turns and, like, strangles Wormtail. Which is like, ooh, that, that's not how you want to end. Ooh. But um, he's a minor character. And he... He doesn't have a, a, any really significant role in the books at all, aside from being the traitor. But J.K. Rowling did, like, did a really great job of giving him a backstory and helping us be able to hear his very unique voice, his ratty voice, and to give us moments where, you know, Wormtail isn't completely evil. There, there are glimmers where he seems kind of decent, even though he is predominantly an evil character. And... I think that's what I was also looking for in later chapters, um, after you've introduced these really exciting characters that I wanted to know more about, but wasn't really able to, yeah, to, to see any complexities in them. Um, I don't know. Izzy, what, what did, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think as I was reading at it, I, that didn't occur to me as much, but I think more because I had been reading it as more of these are sort of, you know, temporary questing companions, and I was reading it for the plot and less for the characters. But I think if 
I mean, if there was a second book, I would, the way I was reading it, I had assumed that Pana would move on and these characters wouldn't even be in book two because they're simply not established enough to be in book two. But um, I think I agree with everything you're saying, Julie. And because the cast is as large as it is, it's kind of an ensemble cast of Vare, Pana and Wave Skimmer are their three main, main characters. And the rest, to me, I didn't focus on as much. And I was like, they're just here to fill the spots in the ensemble that need to be filled. Um, I do think sometimes that runs the risk of them being a little interchangeable, where I would forget what a character's name is, and I'm like, which one is... NC was one of the few that stood out to me because she has a very clear voice and personality. But sometimes some of the other characters, I wasn't sure I needed to go back or I needed to refresh my memory to remember this is that character again. But I think that also depends on how you write um, characters that stay with you versus a character like Tur, who in the... The Guardian of Riotho, ep not episode, but uh, the Guardian of Riotho chapter. That is just a standalone character in a standalone chapter, where you don't need to flesh them out or flesh them out much more. But they do exactly what they need to do in terms of characterization, because of the length of time that they're in there for. And I do think making Tally, Bob, and MC part of and like part of the traveling companion crew um, does, you know, give you a little bit of responsibility to them since they're in there for more than a chapter. And definitely I, as I was reading, was swept up in the, oh man, they've got to chase down all these weapons and destroy them. There's a constricted amount of time and they only know each other for a couple of weeks maybe. But Things can still happen between characters in that time. Like, the scenes with Pana and Like I found really um, important, and some of the most emotional scenes in the book were those scenes. But, and also because of the way the perspective of the book is centered on Pana, everything is filtered through their experience, or sometimes through Wave Skimmer's experience. Um, I think just learning, figuring out creative ways to you know, introduce aspects of these characters that the readers can discover through those characters' eyes as those characters, Pana or Wave Skimmer is discovering them, getting to know them better. Because I think also part of it is Pana especially feels this need for solitude and wanting to, you know, stay away from everyone in case they, it, not logically, but like in case they put them in danger in a, well, semi-logical conclusion, since they know that they're being chased by villagers and just sort of have this mindset that they bring danger wherever they go. So I think potentially leaning into that a little bit more to explain their desire to stay away from other characters and then seeing other characters' reactions to that withdrawal could be a way to open that up more, or finding ways to have Pana connect with the characters in different ways. I just love your comment about you expecting them to not show up in book two. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because um, I'm, I'm trying to like write, I started writing parts of book two and like I have an outline and yeah, I do take them out. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I think, um, as is clear from, from your comments, and this is something that I'm aware of too, like character writing isn't my strength. Um, and I love, I never thought of them as having really good intros, but now that you're saying that, like, I can kind of see it. But in general, I had like no idea really what I was doing with them. I, I mean, I had some ideas, but I struggled with making them continuously relevant <laughs> to what was happening and the the focus is really just on Pana and like Pana's past and Pana's future and 
the past like of the world um and the plot is definitely what i was more interested in writing just as a geographer and again like i love the visions chapter because we get to see like the past of the world yeah i think like as i'm thinking about book two like taking the characters out seems like just a way for me to be a little bit more focused and not have to worry about all these characters and i think izzy your point too about like how they impact the story and how they're like questing companions who are there like for specific purposes is really interesting i'm glad that you liked mc no i mean i think sometimes i thought her her commentary didn't wasn't my favorite i was like that was a little bit rude or uh, i would have not said that um in my personal opinion but her um personality really is clear and i think bob sometimes is a distinct character to me but sometimes he's just the other helpful villager npc and sometimes they feel a little you know npc um <laughs> um not necessarily like stock characters but edging into that realm because they don't have not like you know they should embody a stereotype but have defining characteristics like how mc has that helps you remember who they are, even though they have little or less page time and fewer scenes. Uh, it's interesting to hear, Izzy, that um, MC is the character that, that stood out for you, because uh, for me it was like. Oh, I, I mean, like as well. Um, <laughs> but I think like even could be fleshed out more. I personally wanted to see more of her as the boat captain being the boat captain. She has a couple of scenes being the boat captain. I would have enjoyed more. <laughs> I, I want to hear her talk like a pirate more because that's just hysterical. <laughs> Did you feel that she was like inconsistent as you went through the the stories that she was in? Uh, that might be a leading question. Honestly, so in case viewers have not guessed, uh, I was one of the narrators uh, that Peter excellently enlisted. Um, and I did a lot of the NPC voices in the chapter five recording, including like, and now I, I based like's voice after, after the voice of an NPC, a major NPC that I play in one of my Dungeons and Dragons campaigns, which I DM. So now whenever I think of like, and, uh, he, and read her words on the page, I think of Alia, who, who's my D and D character, and I I impose all of the Alia things that I know and love about her onto like. So, in my mind, the the characters are already kind of confused. Um. So, it 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 it's not a question of did was like inconsistent for me. It she wasn't. Uh, it it was just I. Now whenever I think of her, I think of Alia. And yeah, I love your like voice. <laughs> it was so good. Izzy, you haven't heard it yet. I don't think. No, I don't think I've listened to that chapter yet. Um, that you it comes out. Julie. The episode comes out uh, this Friday. Oh wow! But if you wanted We're finally on story five. But if you wanted, I could of course give you a pre pre you know a preview of what like sounds like, and this is pretty much my Alia voice because I've spoken like this for two years because that's how long my campaign has been, and so yeah, that's honestly perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I raised my leading question just because, like, again, um, now that you've you mentioned the whole idea of like intros. Like's intro does stand out to me as being just like absurd and amazing and I I really had so much fun writing that. And then like I struggled to figure out how she moves through the story and she became less um, likable. Uh <laughs> <laughs> she became less of like, you know, a a, a character and more of just like character in the sense of like having this giant personality and like you know being very present more of just like someone who's who's there and has some good moments i think but doesn't quite embody the same overexcited pirate who doesn't really know how to pirate i can i just quickly when you mentioned taking out 
characters like Tali and Like and MC and Bob and in your second book, obviously, like, that's your choice. Um, and I'm not saying that it's right or wrong, because you're the writer. Um, so you are always in the right. That doesn't make sense. Um, but, you know, like, you, you have control over your story. That That's my disclaimer for what I'm about to say. I obviously was very distressed to hear that because they these characters chose to go with Pana to destroy a, a weapon of mass destruction. And it's really surprising for me to hear that they don't continue in that quest with Pana when they already had chances to turn back and instead stuck with them. So, yeah, I... It makes sense now that, like, you know, if they're not going to be in the next book, you might not develop them as much. Okay, fair. But... They play such a big role in the first book that I was surprised that they don't, they wouldn't show up in the second. That's my two cents. I, but again, like you, you have the con. You are, you are your pirate captain steering your ship. Uh, and I am a mare porpoise, <laughs> briefly passing <laughs> alongside your ship in the bay and squirting water in your general direction through my air hole. Um, <laughs> I mean, I was gonna say, you know, as as a fan of Samwise Gamgee, it makes sense that that would be your perspective. Yeah. So wait, who is not a fan of Sam here? Uh, no, as Julie is a fan, okay. like a huge Sam fan. Okay, I thought you were saying that as in <laughs> she's a fan, but you're less of a fan. I'm obviously less of a fan. I don't like Lord of the Rings. Oh, so, oh but... okay. Well, I mean, that's fair. That's okay. I have mixed feelings about it, but Sam is the best. <laughs> Yeah, just from the from the idea, like the one thing that I know he does is like Frodo's doing something, and Sam is like, people in the stories they they could have turned back, but they didn't. And Julie's comments just reminded me of that. Oh, Sam, but, um, Sam is I love Samwise Gamgee and Gimli are just excellent. They are two great characters. But yeah, I mean, I I I don't know. I feel like the second book is a whole different topic, but. We'll see what happens. I don't know. That's less about them as characters and more. I mean, it, it makes sense now that you say it that they should go on. I just don't know how to write characters as well, and I need to work on that. I'll definitely be going back and like, you know, developing them a little bit more and adding stuff for them to do. Not adding stuff for them to do, but adding some nuance where I can, if I can. I would say. You don't necessarily need to keep the whole gang, or you could have them diverge onto different paths to split up and conquer, you know, go after the different weapons and mm. agree in the beginning, we're all gonna, you know, see each other again in the future, but here's our master plan is to travel in different directions with the same purpose. Because I remember thinking, wait, we're only destroying one weapon? And how that was the very climax of the book was to get to a single weapon. And I was like, wait, I thought we were going to do a mad dash to get to a bunch of them. Because it's very clear that there, there are several that are still existing in this world. But yeah, You can't I do all of them at once. Having them be introduced and become recurring characters in a way that they have a special chapter in the emotionally charged part of the book where they show back up and they're like Pana we give you your emotional support that you need right in this crucial moment but they don't necessarily have to be there for all of book two but I do think it would be a little sad to have them disappear with no explanation I mean that's such an obvious answer and it makes so much sense yeah I think I was too worried about like focusing on other stuff and um I don't want to spoil things. I have like some characters coming in book two who are going to be really important to Pana's story. Obviously, like I really want to focus on the Panavare dynamic. Um, I have a wonderful gnome who's going to show up. <laughs> Does this gnome's ga- name begin with an S? And ends with a, a y. Or B. Yes. <laughs> Shorby's coming in. Oh, this is a wonderful D&D gnome who 
who has a wonderful story of finding self-love and self-acceptance and a frog friend <laughs> <laughs> who somehow is going to fit into book two. I figured I have crazy like animals and, you know, world like doomsday devices and things. I can throw in a gnome. <laughs> yeah. But definitely like I like the idea of having the other characters go on their own way, find other weapons and come back. I think that's a really great idea. I like that a lot better than what my proposition was going to be, which would be have Pana and Wave Skimmer ditch the companions <laughs> and then the companions have to like every now and again we see them because they're trying to find Pana and talk some sense into them and say, yeah, dum dum, you need some support and we're here to give you support whether you want it or not. <laughs> but I like the I, I like the idea so much better of dividing and conquering because that's that's much less that uh, uh, I like that better. <laughs> I I don't think it would be entirely outside of Pana's character to ditch them though. There could be a little bit of ditching, or at least attempted ditching, because I could see <laughs> Pana trying to you know be a. Uh, duo lone wolf lone wolf duo with wave skimmer um but then i i definitely think would expect some kind of pushback from the other characters mm -hmm. and that might provide that might provide some good tension too you could see the characters that not everything is happy go lucky you know i love that idea too though i think i think izzy's idea might be like simpler yes Please, please do Izzy's idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I'm a good enough writer to do the, the intrigue and add that whole dynamic to. Huh. But I, I think it's an interesting thought. It's not entirely different from the way Vare was chasing after Pana, just with different intentions. That's the thing. <laughs> I feel like I would rather focus on the Vare thing and, and not add in this whole new... Pana's running from everyone. Mm -hmm. Like one person is enough. <laughs> but I also just wanted to ask. So definitely, this has been great in like thinking through some of the characters. Is there anything else about the story, either like the plot or the setting, that you had any thoughts about? Because the setting, I feel like the setting, I'm much more happy with in the characters. But obviously, if it can be improved, like, I'd love to hear it. I think for me, there were two other points that I personally would have liked to see clearing up or improving. I, I think I, I, I agree with you, Peter. The setting is very good and very intriguing. And you have so many wonderful details in that story. Just the, the little critters that are, you know, scattering around in that world. It's really exciting to, to discover all of them. And as Pana and Wave Skimmer are, too, so... That's a nice, you know, reader and narrator are both like, where are we? Let's explore together. I like that. Um, I think two things that also caught my eye were just proofreading, uh, which I've, I've mentioned to you earlier, like just making sure you're consistent in punctuation and just uh, general stuff and some pronouns. Um, like some characters have more than one pronoun and it like confused me a little bit though not a whole lot i was able to figure things out um i'm an english major i'm, I'm sorry i notice i notice periods yeah. and commas and things it's an occupation i'm only class. an english minor i i know well if it makes you feel better that's that's how i treat my writing too is i just yeah and i think just on the on the idea of pronouns just really quickly because I'm curious, Izzy, like what you thought. Mm -hmm. And I definitely, and I said this to Julian when we had our own like conversation that wasn't recorded too. When I was writing this, I really wanted to push diversity like in this story. Not like, you know, shove it into the story in ways that didn't make sense. But I really wanted this to be a story where these characters are present and where I kind of explored that. And a big part of that for me was when I introduce characters, a lot of the time, like I'll start off just using they, them, like until the character actually like says, oh, hi, I'm, you know, this person, I'm, I'm MC or Bob or whatever. And 
So I don't know if those are necessarily the points that you're talking about. And if they are, like, me, I just need to, you know, go through proofread and make sure that it's super clear, like, when we transition to their actual pronouns once once we, like, figure out who they are. And if that's not what you're talking about, then I just need to go and proofread. That's a very simple, um, simple thing to say. But I guess, like, Izzy, did you have any similar thoughts about that did you like were you confused by that or and it's okay like if you weren't or were like either way no I remember there was a part I think you had um everything is a draft of a draft of a draft and um in the guardian of Riotho um chapter tear you had decided um they would have they them pronouns and as I had been reading it I was like wait a second they switched from he to they but that was just a a matter of going back and forgetting to revise some previous sentences. Yeah, Tara was originally not non-binary, mm-hmm. and I, I missed some stuff. Yeah, and for the others, I hadn't noticed pronoun mix-ups other than that one. But um, yeah, I think just proofreading. I've, you know, I, I leave you comments <laughs> in the stories. You can disregard them as you will, or act on them. But yeah, just you know proofread it and also having another pair of eyes because sometimes what I find is helpful when I write I know exactly what I want to say and how I'm saying it always makes sense and then somebody else reads it and it doesn't make sense (laughs) yeah I want to want to second that very much find an English major (laughs) Uh... (laughs) you have my number although i yeah, I, I agree with you, Izzy. I, having a second pair of eyes on what I write is definitely very helpful. I think also sometimes the voice, um, just paying attention not just to grammatical things, but also to how you want the reader to you know understand the world and how you're speaking about it can be very important. And a lot of the voice comes through and I hear, I just hear you speaking and telling me the story because it sounds so familiar to me the way that you write. Um, but I think also, you know, being wary of, you know, going complete stream of consciousness or completely into a way of speaking that is entirely your own, but doesn't necessarily convey what the story needs or... um Finding a voice that is specific to the story and making sure it is consistent throughout. Which I guess is difficult to proofread for in a way, but I think you do have a unique voice that is in this story, but certainly in the earlier chapters, it's not as developed. And in the later chapters, you can really hear it more. So I'd say just, you know, go back through the earlier chapters especially. For consistency. Can I raise the other thing that I wanted to bring up, if that's okay with you too? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so the, the proofreading was, was one. Um, but I think the other thing that really threw me, and this kind of builds on what we were talking about pronouns, is the character Naka. Um, and again, like Peter, we've had this conversation before. Um, I liked Naka, but I I was confused because throughout the story, Naka uses he, him pronouns. Um, and so that made me think, oh, Na- Naka's a man. But then when Pana is sitting down to talk with Naka, Naka explains how he you know, ran off with a visitor who was visiting the village and then got kicked out. They, they became a couple and then Naka got pregnant. Um, and at that point in the story, I was, you, you kind of lost, I, I, um, and I wasn't sure, uh, I like how that was possible. I, and for, I, for better or worse, I am a very literal person. Um, and was struggling to to picture a guy having kids um 
and that's just my experience as a reader. Yeah, um, and hearing you, I, you're welcome to correct my rendition of what you said to me in that conversation, Peter, but you explained later that Naka identified as male, and I interpreted that as, okay, Naka may have been born female, but no longer identified as female, but as male. Um, so, I don't know. I, Izzy, I'd love to hear what, what you thought about that, and if that tripped you up at all, all or if, you know... Like, did Naka make sense? Um, what were your reactions? Um, I would say I did. Um, it took me a second to connect the dots and think, oh, yeah, Naka um, is trans. And that's how that how, that's how that works. But I think it's also a difficult, like, practice to figure out how to manage what readers are expecting and also the entirely different society that exists in this story that isn't beholden to what our societal standards have now and also the fact that I mean even today men can have children and it's just not where the mind immediately jumps to because I mean of course the visibility of trans people is becoming much more mainstream, and that's really great. But I think being aware of how readers are expecting to read a story and to read and understand a character, there are certain ways, I think, that that could trip up a reader. And I am familiar, you know, I have people who... Uh, I have friends who are trans, so, like, I, that sounds so weird to say. But I'm... Not like I wasn't thrown off guard completely in the sense that this was a completely foreign concept to me. But I do think for some readers, it is definitely not something they're familiar with. And this story is t geared to young adult, I think. Yeah. Young adults. So some of them know, and some of them, you know, might still be learning yeah. as they're, you know, being introduced to this book. And I don't think you have to decide which readership you want to re write to, but I think just being aware of how readers will react to it could be good in how you're writing and framing a character. Not that you have to go in and do this whole exposition of like, this is how this works and all of that, but I think maybe having some foregrounding within the society that separate from Naka's character itself of like, you know, there are some trans people here, and, you know, it's a common practice for if somebody's, you know, born female, then they just, you know, tell their parents, hey, actually, I'm a boy, and, you know, I'm your son, and they're like, okay, cool, and just, I guess, setting that expectation for the society in general um, would make it more comprehensible within the terms of this story, I think, which partly happens just naturally through Pana as a character existing, although slightly different since they're non-binary. So I guess also going along with the character thing, the setting of the village as a society in itself, sometimes I had questions about Vare, for instance, her motivations were unclear to me because I didn't know what kind of social framework she came from and what, you know, how her, you know, nurturing as she grew up shaped her versus Pana. And there are assumptions I can make based on my own social upbringing, but I don't want to make those assumptions and apply them, you know, slapdash to this whole new human cooperative community <laughs> that you have created that follows whatever rules you want to make up. I mean, I really, really appreciate these comments and these thoughts. And <laughs> again, sorry, Julie, you have to relive this conversation. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to explain it in a kind of the same way that I did before. And again, I mean, there may very well be aspects of this that, like, my writing could just be better. I'm sure that is part of it. But. Another thing that was really important to me as I was writing this. So again, like, 
stories centered around LGBTQ people, I feel like are not that common. And I definitely have read like a ton since 2020. And I, I made it a point though to like go on this audio book app Libby and find all the books that I could I could find. But in general, this you know, these are in characters that people read about. And in many cases, these are characters and books that are that are banned and are in the process of being banned. Shout out Florida. It felt really important to me to just kind of again not shove characters into the book and if it came out that way then like I do need to work on that but I really wanted to make sure that these characters existed and that they were given voices and that this wasn't some crazy like big deal um and there's there's different ways that different people have thought about this like do you make the point of your book about these issues and you really explain like why these people are allowed to exist or because it's a fantasy book do you just make them exist and you're like oh okay this society like there are no issues around lgbtq plus rights and i mean if you want a great example of that check out the owl house tv show where like amity and loose like they just get together and there's no explanation of like you know, Amity doesn't need to go to her parents and be like, oh, like, hi, I'm dating a girl now. Like, it just happens and everyone's like, okay. And it's just not a part of the story. Um, the relationship is part of a story, but not the struggles of the the queer kids in that. And that's kind of what I just wanted to do. And there's a lot of, like, random background characters, too, who aren't named, who every so often there's, like, someone at one village who's, like, oh, like, she and her wife got onto the boat together, and so there are a lot of people, like, thrown into the background, and some of these other minor characters, like Naka, who does have a name, I just kind of wanted these people to exist. So all that's to say is that I'm glad that, like, you at least read it, and even if that confusion's there, I think, hopefully, that speaks, I mean, it might speak to my writing, but I think it also potentially speaks to the fact that these characters just aren't present in stories and we're not familiar with these types of characters. And I'm hoping that this, you know, maybe like if this book ever gets published, I'm hoping that there are a lot of people who read it and are confused and then go on to learn more about these issues. And maybe, you know, future books will start to include more characters like this, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I don't know how well I worded all of that, um, but I think that's kind of where where I'm at. I want these characters to exist. I want people to be aware of them, um, and I want conversations to, to happen about those. And I think it's interesting, too, like, this is a national conversation to some degree, And there was literally just a congressional hearing where, like, um, there was some, I don't know who the person was, but they're talking to the Senate about, like, the recent Supreme Court rulings. And they had one person, like, talk to Senator um, Josh Hawley and was, like, he basically asked, like, oh, like, but guys can't get pregnant. And the person was, like, actually, they can. That's why the language around certain things needs to be this way. And, like, we need to think about how our language includes or excludes certain people um so it's just interesting like seeing that happen literally in our in the u.s senate right now so all that's to say that i really appreciate your thoughts and your comments your confusion it's all all appreciated definitely see that um you know sort of the work is being done by the the text that you have written and I do appreciate, you know, having those little um, bits sprinkled in with some of the side characters or just, you know, making your main character be non-binary is in itself not common at all. And I really appreciate that everybody just uses their pronouns correctly and there's never a conversation of like, 
how do I use they, them as, pr as singular pronouns, which is so frustrating because people know at this point, or if they can't, don't know, they can learn. So I do appreciate that. I think um, for Naka's character specifically, that is just one of those things where some people have, you know, familiarity with trans people or are trans themselves and, you know, it just clicks and other people, readers will, you know, not some readers just won't like it or just will either not understand or refuse to do the work to understand. But I don't think it's on you to handhold all readers in that way. But I would love to know more about the village and how the social structure is. <laughs> just a little. Well, Pana left the village, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's some flashbacks. No, I definitely, that's a, that's a great point. But no, no, thank you so much. And like, again, like, could my writing be better? Absolutely. I'm a creative writing minor who, like, I don't know if my writing's any good. I've just shared it with friends who are, you know, I'm super glad to hear you're praising. But I've, I've never given it to, like, other people to read. And it hasn't been published, so I don't know. I guess I'll just say quickly, I, I really appreciate hearing you talk about um, your intentions for this, Peter. Hearing you talk about it helped me better understand Naka. Um, I think I'm one of those readers that I'm not quite sure how I feel about it. I, yeah, I, I don't know how I feel about it, but... Um, I think that's less of a this like this is a situation with your story thing and more of a this is a kind of me thing that I'm gonna have to think about. Um, but I don't know. At, at the very least, I I whatever you decide to write and however you decide to write it, I do want to be respectful and I do want to listen and read it and learn, um, even if that means making some awkward mistakes on my part um, in that learning process and. Yeah. And I appreciate hearing your comments too, Izzy, because that, like, yeah. Aw, love you, Julie. Um, <laughs> so much better than our senator who I mentioned. But, well, he's not my senator. He's from Missouri, and he's silly. But, anyway, um, moving on. Like the porpoise next to the boat, we are indeed sailing forth. <laughs> yeah. So at this point, do you, do you guys have your lines? Yes. Yes. Do I have my? <laughs> I don't know if I have a line, but I might. Okay, um, we'll we'll start with you guys, and as you're talking, I will I will multitask, which has been proven to be impossible by neuroscientists. <laughs> I will do it anyway. Um, That's why I'm so bad at it. <laughs> I think I've read in like multiple places. Like you, you technically can like to some degree, but you can never put like your full attention into two things. Anyway, so as we kind of close out each episode we all picked or will pick a line that we just like for some reason and we'll just like briefly chat about it and we'll all share our lines and then we'll we'll close the episode so who wants to go first who isn't me i can go first izzy unless you are you would like to go first no go for it okay um and i appreciate what you shared um just, you know, having openness to talk about these things. Thank you. I appreciate your appreciation <laughs> and your conversation. Talk about your lines. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Peter's like, come on, guys, gotta keep this moving. Um, so I have chose two. I'm sorry. I'm such a troublemaker. They're both about like, also not surprising. Um, am I going to read them in my Alia voice? Yes, you bet. Gosh hey. darn it. Um, <laughs> so the first one, um, these are both from chapter five, um, where it, like, in Like's initial conversation with Pana, she says, I hope you find a boat and a captain, <laughs> ideally the captain of said boat. <laughs> and then the, the second one is, it's very wet outside on account of the water and all, she told Pana, flicking her head and showering everyone nearby with water. I, I just, I just love these moments because... She she's so kind of repetitive in a way that's hysterical and it makes me laugh so much. 
that chapter was peak like moments. And I think that the first line that you said was one of my lines when we went through that chapter, I think. I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> my memory is not that good. I can go now. I um, chose a line from chapter three towards the end of it. As for the stone, it seemed just as ordinary as usual. Again, I, I love the rock. This is from the Guardian of Riotho chapter, where the stone absorbs the guardian shadow creature thing and then just goes back to being a regular rock. And I just love what it's a wonderful sort of introduction to the stone, not just being inert granite or whatever the heck it is made of. And it actually has some mysterious powers that finally make an appearance without even Pana actively trying to use it. And then it goes back to being a rock, a paperweight. I, I'm a fan of The Rock. I, I love how much you are a fan of The Rock. It makes me love The Rock even more. I was worried about The Rock, but I like that I'm so hardened by the fact that you like The Rock. I just like mysterious magical items. I don't know. I just want to jump in and say The Rock originally was a staff. And I'm glad that I changed it to a, a rock. A staff is not as a cool. St- too conventional. That was part... I mean, I wasn't thinking, like, oh, too conventional. I feel like I had some other thoughts around, like, oh, this is just kind of awkward. And, like, it's just a big stick. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, like... <laughs> I didn't want... Um, like, at first, Pana was going to use it as, like, a weapon, too. And they were going to be, like, a staff-wielding person. Um, I mean, Pana wasn't even Pana at first. Like, Pana was originally this character named George. Ah, George. But this has been many years in the making. Oh, yeah, I think you read some, like, with George. Okay. I did. But, no, I think The Rock was better. And just, like, as I became an Earth scientist, it was fun to have a rock in there. Um, <laughs> but I think also the, the whole idea of, like, The Rock not being used for combat was really important, too. Like, Pana does not fight like almost ever and i think most of the action scenes is like pana protecting i would like to say (laughs) do i have a line i might i think this is helen who in the visions chapter i don't think that we like know this is helen at first like pana is embodying this person as Pana is seeing the past. And this is their learning about how the apocalypse kind of happened. And there's, so Pana is like some person who's just working in this like secret underground base thing. And Pana goes up to the president of the US, who I hope I made it explicit enough who he is. But Pana goes through this whole thing like the president's like oh why is everyone coming after me like the world is falling apart what's happening and pana's basically like you know listing off like hey you you told us to do this like you planted these weapons you burned the amazon you bombed antarctica like you did all these things um i need to add in tried to overthrow democracy now but the final thing like pana sums it up by just saying you did this And I just, something that's really interesting to me is just accountability and how we avoid it, how we, how we enact accountability. You know, I've been really invested in like hearing the hearings recently. Uh, This is probably months, we're going to release this episode like months after um, we actually record it. We're recording it in July. I don't think we have room on the schedule until january so if you don't know what i'm talking about just go look at the news from months and months before but i i'm really just interested in this idea of accountability and i think it's really interesting seeing pana as this person in the past going up to this this president and being like you did this and just seeing the reaction and seeing the world afterwards 
and the fact that Pana needs to go and like disable all these weapons that are still active like thousands of years into the future. And obviously, like I think part of the story too is accountability for like you know Pana and Pana's own journeys. Like you have this the world accountability for like the world and like the past of the world and society, and then like the past of the individual, the past of Pana, and. I really had so much fun thinking about it and trying to trying to think through this idea of of the past and accountability and what responsibility looks like. Is that my favorite line? I don't know, but I didn't come prepared. <laughs> <laughs> when you when in doubt, you add a little bit out. Yeah. It's a good thought though. I enjoy I mean this that was my favorite chapter in I, again, characters I struggle with, I I much more enjoyed, and I think I did the plot and, like, the, the world building a little bit better. I, I hope. I was, I'm always a fan of world building, but I was a fan. Mm-hmm. Yay. I need to go back and make the village more fleshed out. But in general. <laughs> is there any last minute things that anyone wants to add? I enjoyed talking about this Pana cycle with you, Julie. And with you, Izzy. And with you, Peter. Thank you for having me. This was really delightful. Yes, and I enjoyed it as well. <laughs> <laughs> we all had fun. We're true winners. So everyone, thank you for listening to Determination, Deliberation, and Dragons. We hope you enjoyed all of our conversations about the Pana and Wave Skimmer cycle. We've had a lot of great conversations about it. If you want to check out our Patreon, the link is in the description down below. And feel free to check out our Twitter, where it's mostly me just posting quotes from books and movies and shows and the occasional picture of a raccoon. So we are at Det Del Dragons. Search for us there. Subscribe. Share with your friends, tell your neighbors, whatever you want to do. Have a great whatever time of day it is that you're listening to this. <laughs>